The following is a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. For more information, please visit our website at dallasgenealogy.com. We see him at the Texas State Genealogical Conference, which this year will be another virtual meeting as well. Uh, but uh, it's always nice to see him where we can see him in person. Uh, if you're looking at him on screen, you'll notice one difference. While a number of people have done sort of uh, shelter at home beards, he's sort of gone the other way in terms of trying to wear a mask <laughs> that it can be a little bit more secure if you don't have it. <laughs> so the picture is not current, but his presentation is very current. This is one he sort of put together, particularly for us in our group, and we appreciate that. So. Kevin, it's all yours. I'll stop sharing. Well, well thank you, Bernard. Uh, thank you for having me. And like Bernard said, I'm with the Texas General Land Office. I've been here for about 19 years. And over the last probably five or six years, I've really taken an interest in our German collection. I figured if, you know, if I'm going to really truly learn the German collection, well, I'm, I need to learn my own background. And uh, like some Families, you know, my father's side never really did talk much about, you know, where they came from or the old country. Uh, and now everybody has passed away. So I had to learn all this all by myself. And I had subtle clues that I remember. Uh, I remember at a very early age, you know, uh, my uh, great grandmother speaking German to me. Uh, my descendants came over the last batch, came over in 1898. They did not come with the Texas uh, group that came in the 1840s that, were, uh, that was after. So I did a lot of research. In fact, I was in Germany last year. Uh, I was actually supporting uh, or going to uh, the commemoration of the Berlin Airlift, the 70th anniversary. So I was supporting a C-47 that we flew over from San Marcos to uh, take part in the uh, Normandy celebrations and then also to uh, Berlin, uh, flew all over Germany. And while I was there, I, I spent about three weeks and did some research on my family. Come to find out, I still have uh, some relatives, distant relatives still living in Germany. I went to my hometown or my, my uh, ancestor's hometown. And uh, it was just an incredible, fascinating uh, trip. And I became very fascinated with passenger lists. And we'll go into that. I don't want to bore you with a lot of statistics or data. I'm just going to go through the history of the Adelsvenein, the Texas Germans that came in the 1840s, uh, along with uh, how the, you know, what it was like for those people to come to Texas. So I would like to share my presentation, if that's okay. Let's see here. Okay, and while you're doing that, I will mention he does have two handouts there. You can see them in the chat. If you look at that, and we'll have them on the website as well. And uh, if you do have a, a question, a short one, uh, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll save the questions for after he's finished speaking. All right, so here, here's the uh, title screen. Uh, also, with my phone number and email, I've also got that information on the end slide. Uh, if you enjoy what I'm going to share, uh, send me an email. Or if you have questions, send me an email. Be you know, feel free to do that. So the Adelsverein, this is the Society for, Society for the Protection of German Immigrants, or otherwise known as the Society for the Protection of German Immigrants. Um, back in 1842, April 20th, you've got 20 uh, 21 nobles that met at Biebrich, Germany. And they came up with this idea of creating this German economic foothold. Come to Texas. You know, the, the conditions in Germany were not very favorable. There was overcrowding. The economy was poor. If you wanted to uh, own land, if you were a farmer, if you wanted to own land, that was difficult. You know, it was really just the nobility that had those kind of resources. It was not a very well-funded organization, uh, but they, they did the best they could. This is Schloss Biebrick. Now, this is where those noblemen met back in 1842. I actually visited this. Uh, incredible place. And, it, you know, this is the Rhine River in front. 
Back behind it, there's probably another 50 acres. And I walked a good deal of this. It's just incredible grounds. When I was there, uh, I couldn't really get access to the building. They had a, the city now owns this. This is outside of Wiesbaden. The city owns it and they do it, they use it for various functions, festivals. At the time I was there, they had an equestrian uh, competition going on. And so all these grounds you see behind uh, the building, that was set up for horses and jumping, uh, showing horses, it was incredible. But in the very center here, you see this round rotunda looking built structure. And down here, there's a little doorway. And this is restaurants. You can sit out there and eat and have coffee, whatever. But I was able to talk one of the waiters to let me go in and, and take a look. And it was you know, just an amazing building. Above all the doors and windows, you see all these, you know, architectural features that uh, like cannons and ships. And so they were, you know, they had a lot of commerce in mind when they were, when they were creating this. This is the uh, palace of the Duke of Nassau. But uh, again, this is an incredible place. Um, now, when the Germans came up with this idea, let me see here. Go with us to Texas. So why are they going? Well, the, there were lenient colonization laws in Texas. Uh, we're a new republic. We're trying to bring in immigrants. And so just like the Spanish period, you know, you had Stephen F. Austin, uh, Valen, DeWitt. Uh, they're all bringing in these colonists under Mexico. Well, Texas had the same idea. We are going to produce colonies or, or create these colonies uh, you had the Adelsbrine, you had Peter's Colony. Uh, Peter's Colony is, was up in your area, Bernard, that's up in the Dallas area. Uh, you also had Castro's Colony down to the south. But what's interesting is when you uh, look or read some of the, uh, there, there was a proclamation, not a proclamation, but a, uh, uh, I guess a meeting held by uh, Lamar. And he talks about how we're going to set up these colonies. We're going to set them up along the northern edge of the frontier, the western edge of the frontier, and down to the south is basically a barrier between the civilized regions to the south and the east, and uh, as a kind of a bulwark between uh, the tomahawk, as in, as in his words, the tomahawk and the civilized areas. So these poor folks, they were out there on the frontier basically as a barrier for the Indians. Now, while they were thinking about coming, you've got Germans such as Frederick Ernst, he's here in Texas, he was in the revolution. Uh, they're writing letters. People are writing letters back home to Germany talking about you know, the freedoms they're uh, experiencing, the wide open spaces, the uh, uh, ability to obtain land and how much land you could get. You've also got people like uh, uh, Charles Selsfield. He writes the Cabin Book. And the Cabin Book is an interesting, uh, an interesting read. Uh, basically, when you read it, it sounds like you'll go to Texas and every time you put your shovel in the dirt, you're going to come up with some sort of riches. It's, it's this kind of uh, uh, fanciful depiction of Texas. And so people are reading these things. They get the idea of coming. So, when the Adelsbrein decides to create this uh, endeavor, they send two emissaries. That would be Booz Valdek and uh, Count Leinengen. They come to Texas to kind of scope out the area, see what the conditions are, and try to obtain a contract uh, for colonization. They meet with Sam Houston. Uh, they try to propose that they did not want to pay taxes for a period of two years. Sam Houston did not go for that. Uh, he told them no, bid them farewell, and they went on their way. <coughs> Excuse me, about the same time, uh, it was, I believe it was Line Engine, uh, they scope out the area that would later be uh, uh, the property known as Nassau Plantation. So they purchased that. And uh, it was Busvaldek he goes back to Germany 
and each one writes a letter. Leiningen was very much in favor of colonization. Buzvaldek, he was kind of against it. He could see that there would be many hardships involved, uh, a lot of logistical problems to, uh, that would be experienced. But regardless, uh, they go ahead with the endeavor. They meet up, let me see, get to my next one here. So before they come to Texas, they did not have a contract with the Texas government. They meet up with uh, Diorvain and Ducos, two speculators here in Texas. They'd already had a contract. They decide to partner with them. However, the contract with Ducos and Diorvain was already expired. They thought they could extend it, get it reestablished, but it did not work. Meanwhile, handbills are being printed up. The Germans are ready to come over. They're on the ships about to come over. Well, Prince Carl uh, Sons Braunfels, he comes over about 1842, 43 time frame, and sees the conditions uh, here in Texas, realizes that he is the head of a uh, commissioner of, of a colony without an acre of land. Luckily, about that same time, you've got two others, uh, Burkhold Miller and Henry F. Fisher. They meet with the Adelsgrein back in Germany. They've already got a contract to settle, uh, settle colonists in Texas, but they don't have anybody to fill those spots. And so they partner with the Fisher Miller Company. So when you look at our collection, when you look at the GLO documents, you'll find that we have these German immigration contracts, the Fisher-Miller contracts, or the uh, Fisher-Miller transfers, and you've got the grants issued under the auspices of the Fisher-Miller company. Now, when you came to Texas, most of the colonists would arrive either in Galveston or sometimes head straight to Indianola. Most of the time they're coming to Galveston they will resupply. Some of the passengers would either stay there or they would stay on board and carry on to Indianola. When you got to Indianola, you would land at uh, Carl Schaffen or Indianola. Uh, and then there were various way stations along the way. Agua Dulce, Victoria, Gonzales, Seguin, on your way to uh, New Braunfels. Now we have over 2,000 German immigration contracts. These contracts show the origin uh, of where they're coming from in Europe, the city where they're from, the date they left Europe. Many times it'll have original signatures. Also on some of them, it, not all, but on some, you will find the names of their wives. Uh, and many times it will give the maiden name of the wife. It may give you an idea of how many children uh, the immigrant is bringing with them. This is an example of uh, one of our German immigration contracts. This is for Johann Heil, uh, done in August 26th of 1846. Beautiful script, uh, the way they're doing these documents. Now, it's always puzzled me. I don't know where these things were printed. There's, there's some questions that I have. You know, where were they printed? How were they distributed? Uh, there are at least two or three different variations of these documents, uh, but beautiful documents nonetheless. This is another version. Now, this has the seal of the Atlas of Rhine. This is for Johann Gruß. Now, Johann Gruß was also a commissioner here at the land office. This was done, whoops, excuse me, my office phone is going off and I'm not supposed to be here. Uh, this is done August 14th of 1845. And he's leaving from Bremen. You'll see here on it's, uh, the end of the contract will tell you the date and what port they're leaving out of. Also, we have, have these Fisher-Miller transfers. Now, Fisher-Miller, depending on who you talk to, some people thought they were you know, on the up and up. Some people thought he was a scallywag. Uh, and this contract was proposed 
that let's say you're ahead of a family, you're coming over, you're eligible for 640 acres. But Fisher and Miller decided that if you're coming over, we want, you will turn over half of your land holdings to the company, which the company would then sell and use for their benefit. The legislature got wind of this. They did not agree to this. And so this never came about. When you look at any of the Fisher Miller grants, if you're eligible for 640 acres as a married man, or if you're a single person, you would get 320 acres, you would get that many, that much land. But still, even though these documents, nothing ever came about, uh, they, you know, it didn't happen. These documents are still great clues as to, uh, for genealogy. So it will tell you the ship's name. This is for the James Edward that they're coming over on. They are from Antwerp. He arrived in Galveston on the 18th, or yeah, 18th of November, 1845. Being a married man, he's eligible for 640 acres of land. So it tells you what ship they came on, where, are they, where do they depart, and when they arrived in, in, into Galveston, and you know, their, their marital status. So great documents are great information uh, for genealogy. The Germans, when they came over, there were various ships that brought them at least over 70 ships, uh, 70, 70 different ships. Uh, not only were they carrying passengers, but cargo, tobacco, sugar, uh, textiles, uh, cotton was going back and forth. You know, these ship owners and the ship captains they had to make a profit as they were doing this. And so they came, and also, uh, they're not only going to Texas, they're stopping in you know, uh, uh, England, the UK, they're going to the US, probably New Orleans. Uh, so shipping, not only passengers, but also cargo. There were two types of ships that would usually bring in these immigrants. It would be a bark, a three-masted sailing ship, or a brig with two masts. This is a bark. Now this is a little news clipping from the Texas uh, Register and Telegraph. Uh, this is from March 27th of 1844. What's interesting when you look at this, so here is where they're from. And under Bremen, you've got the Vesser, the Brig Vesser, Hesperus, the Ferdinand, Garonne, Herschel, De Union, uh, also, uh, let's see, here's more under Bremen, the Brig Matilda, the Galliot, uh, Brig Fanny Maria, also the Brig Heinrich. But what's interesting is looking at where all these ships are coming from. You've got, uh, they're from New Orleans, some are from Liber Liverpool, Amsterdam, uh, New York, Norfolk, Bermuda, so Galveston was a big shipping and receiving area. This is a, a big area of commerce. Uh, the journey would take normally two to three months. You would arrive in Galveston to resupply. Now some would stay in Galveston. Some would uh, either visit Galveston and then get back on the ship and head on over to Indianola. Now we don't have any passenger lists from Germany. Uh, no passenger lists exist from Bremen, Antwerp, or Hamburg uh, prior to 1920. Those are incomplete after we had World War I, World War II. We've lost most of those uh, records from that. Um, there was a law probably around 1850, 1860 uh, set up in, in uh, Bremen that uh, we're going to keep the current year and the past two years of ship lists. Well, that went on for a number of years and then they still decided that we're running out of room to keep these lists, so they destroyed those. So what records do we have of these passengers that are coming over? You've got uh, the Galveston Custom House records. In Galveston, the customs house was in charge of regulating uh, commerce, generating revenue, levying taxes and duties upon incoming goods. 
They're also keeping track of what ships are coming in, keeping a list of the crews and the passengers. So for many, many years, this has acted as what we know or what we have as a passenger list for those folks coming in with the Atlas Rhine. Now, we're, you're, there were three main ports. This is not a very good map, but it's, it's something I came up with uh, that kind of encompasses everything. Here's Bremen. This is your main point of embarkation. Hamburg was another, and then some were leaving from Antwerp here in Belgium. Now I did have plans, as Bernard says, I, I, I was hoping to return to Germany. Uh, I, there's so much research that I wanna get done. Um, I still believe that there could be some sort of uh, telltale signs of maybe a passenger list or two in Germany. Uh, if anything, I'm fascinated with the history of those ships that were leaving. You know, how were they built? You know, there are numerous shipping companies in the area of Bremen and Bremerhaven. This is the statue of Roland. Uh, that's in the uh, Market Square or the Rathaus uh, Platz in Bremen. Um, it's erected or it was erected in 1404, stands over 18 feet tall. Uh, he was a knight in the Holy Roman Empire under Charlemagne. And he stands as the protector of the city of Bremen for liberty and freedom. And there's a legend that says that if Roland ever falls, that within the basement of the Rathaus, there is a duplicate statue, a smaller duplicate statue that they could hurry up and, and, and mount, you know, put it up on the pedestal if the worst should happen. But and I would love to go and, and ask and see if there really is a, a duplicate statue. Uh, but it, what amazes me is this has been here since 1404. Bremen is your main point of embarkation. How many of our ancestors probably passed by this? This is the last thing, one of the last things that they saw as they're leaving Germany, leaving their homeland. And it's not like many of the people that are coming to Texas, let's say you're from Alabama, it's a matter of loading up a wagon, you know, come to Texas if you can make a go of it, great. If you can't, you know, it's not that hard to load up a wagon and go back to Alabama. If you're leaving for Germany, from Germany, coming to America, coming to Texas, it's not, you know, it's not an easy, tri uh, an easy trip. Uh, you're leaving your family, your homeland, everything you're comfortable with, everything you have lived with your whole life and coming to this new frontier. Now, this is a, uh, uh, if you notice on that little newspaper paper clipping, the Herschel was mentioned. This is a picture of the Herschel. This is Captain Lampke, uh, who was in charge of that at the time. In Bremen, on the Weser River, uh, this is one of the most important shipbuilding regions in Germany and perhaps even the world at that time. You've got numerous uh, shipbuilders in the, in the region that have been there for ages, and some of them still exist today. Uh, many of the commercial shipbuilding, uh, much of it began in the mid 1700s and went on through early 1900s. Uh, but even today, you still find the names associated with some of these early shipbuilders uh, from the 1800s. So this is what it's like on the ship. The middle deck, you've roughly got about 65 feet by 26, uh, 26 feet and six foot high ceilings. Uh, the berths you can see here along the sides, uh, they're roughly six foot long and they're stacked one on top of the other. And you've got five passengers to a berth. So we're talking a mother and a father, uh, perhaps uh, children. Um, and in between, you know, in between this area, this is your living area but you've got suitcases, you've got crates, you've got equipment. And so making, you know, finding your way through these ships was, was not an easy task. Also, you know, not the best conditions. You know, it was, it was smelly, it was dirty. Uh, it, was, it was not, you know, like a carnival cruise. This is, you know, this is a hard endeavor that you're undertaking.
So this is one of the passenger lists uh, from the customs house. And what's great about it, you do have names of individuals here. You've got their occupation in this. Uh, oh no, this is not occupation. This is where they're from. This is Germany. Here's the occupation. Uh, and it may say farmer. It may say merchant. It may say uh, mechanic. Uh, and then you've got the ages of individuals along with, uh, I can't see. But anyway, the, you know, this is great. Uh, great information. Also, when you tie that together with the Fisher Miller transfers, it kind of confirms some of this. But what else is there? How do they arrive? So uh, this is the German immigration contract. And I looked through, remember I said there's over 2,000, there's 2,600 of these. Uh, I looked through every one, every single one. Every once in a while, I would run across this kind of red, uh, kind of, uh, I guess, grease pencil is what it looks like, uh, writing. And this is Louis Ferdinand. And also says 46. And this is the page number. Louis Ferdinand was one of the ships that were coming over. It departed in 1846. It arrived in Galveston in January of 1847. So the 46 denotes uh, the departure. The more I looked into this, I became fascinated about you know, what does this mean? And I was, I was uh, and I still am, uh, putting this, into a, this data into a spreadsheet. Here it is again, a little closer view. And this is for a uh, Johann Klaas. Again, you see Ferdinand, Louis Ferdinand, the 46. Here's another one. This is for uh, Johann Mueller. And this, he was coming aboard the Louise. Again, they're departing in 1846. Here's a page number. And this is hard to read. I've got, a, I've got a better shot on the next slide, but I wanted to point out, uh, I've got the immigrant name, contract date, the German immigrant contract, the file number. I'm also plugging in new data. Now, pretty soon when I'm done, when you go to the General Land Office website and you're searching for a German immigrant, uh, you will find for the German immigrant data or the contract data sheet, it will tell you what, what ship they were on and also the town they left from. And so this is great information. Not only is it telling you the port they're leaving from, all of these left from Bremen. I have been capturing what city did these people leave from. So if you look, here is, uh, this is somebody coming in or people coming in under, under the ship Boleyn. Then you've got the Louis Frederica. Elise and Charlotte. Here's a better Im image. The contract date, the contract number, the city where they are from, the departing port, Antwerp, and these, this group was coming over on the Talisman, the ship, the Talisman. This is the ship, the Sarah Ann. Also, it named the captain uh, on this document. So, when you find the document by itself, it may not mean too much. But as I put this into a spreadsheet and started looking at it, what I believe, and at one time, all of these, if you go back early enough in our history, uh, the contracts were bound in books when they came to the GLO. This probably happened around 1850, between 1850 and 1860. Now, I wish I could go back in time because somewhere along the line, these books were dismantled. And then all the documents were put into individual file folders. But it is my belief that these books, as the immigrant was getting 
on or about to board the ship, either in Antwerp or Hamburg or Bremen. For in this case, you've got this immigrant coming in, uh, gives you the, sh the town they're from. Uh, they're leaving from Antwerp. And the first document in that series, it has the name of the ship. And then after that, all these file numbers, they line up and the dates, they start to line up. So I believe what we have going on here, nobody's looked at this in such a way. This may be the de facto passenger list for the Adelsmaran. So the customs house records, that was created in Texas at the point when they arrived. I believe this was done at the point of departure and really is the closest thing we have to a passenger list where they departed. And it gives you other nice clues, like the, the name of the town where these people are coming from. So this is, this is brand new data, um, great information, uh, and we've never really had it this way before. I'm hoping to be done with my research and to have it all put together uh, by this year, and hopefully I'll be putting it into a book uh, sometime next year. So I want to go over some other things that, uh, and also at the end, I want to show you the land grant database and see how this all ties together and how you can search for your ancestors in our database. But I want to go over uh, how this kind of started with my own family looking at passenger lists. So we'll come and see, where are you from? Uh, in my case, uh, my family came up from around the Dort, uh, uh, from the Dusseldorf region, uh, North, North Westphalen, and they would leave from uh, Antwerp. It was the easiest point for them to depart. They left in 1898. Uh, also, when you look at some of these Germans, uh, the naming conventions, uh, the 18th century German naming convention, uh, at the time of christening or baptism, the first name is often a saint's name and the second is the given name. So you may have, have uh, Johann Heinrich, or in this case, uh, Jakob Wilhelm Klaus, or Caspar Heinrich Klaus, he probably went by Heinrich, or he may have gone by Wilhelm or, or William. Another form is you've got naming patterns such as the first son named after the paternal grandfather, the second son named for the maternal grandfather, and so on and so forth. So this can be very confusing, especially in modern databases where they're capturing the full name, not realizing that, you know, this is usually a saint name or a Christian, not, not the Christian or given name. So it can be, it can be confusing when you're researching these families and you'll see names used over and over and over again. So this is a passenger list uh, for the Kensington. Uh, this is a family uh, known as the Themans. Uh, they're coming over um, in 1898. Uh, but passenger lists are, are great from this time period. It can give you clues as to uh, ages of family members, and it will give you the full family. Uh, when we looked at the customs house records or when you're looking at the uh, German immigration contracts, it does not give you the full family. In some cases it may, but not, you know, not, not always. Now this is the Kensington. This is the ship my family came over. It's certainly not like a, a bark or a brig. Uh, the conditions may have been a little better and it did not take three months to get across uh, the ocean to America. This would usually take around two weeks. A little bit better. Uh, and and it was, it's amazing how quickly the shipping and, and the transportation, uh, how, how it advanced and uh, evolved so quickly. So when you look at the Kensington passenger list, it left from Antwerp on, July, on June 25th of 1898. It arrives in New York July 5th of 1898. You've got a Hermann Themen. He's the father, 38, married. They're from Gladbach, Germany. You've got Angelica, the wife, Siegfried, Peter, Wilhelm, Johann, and a two-month-old infant named Gertrude. 
On column 11 of that passenger list, you're say, it, it asks, where are you going? And they go, they, they say, Pittsburgh, are you joining a relative? Uh, yes, they're going to go visit Albert Roethlisberger, uh, the brother-in-law to, uh, to Angelica. So they're going to Pittsburgh, PA. When you're looking at, you probably already know this, but look at everything you possibly can. Passenger lists, birth and death records. Uh, look at birth and death records in Germany. Uh, also look at city directories. Now in this case, uh, this is from 1899, you've got an Angelica Temin, widow of Herman. And they're from Gerst, or they're living on Gerst Alleyway. Here's another one from 1902. Oh, to back up. Um, I could not find this family at all on the 1900 uh, census record. Uh, I don't know why, but they do not show up. In 1902, here's, an, here's a theme in Angela, widow of Herman, and they're in Allegheny, right outside of uh, Pittsburgh. Now, 1913, here's another one. And again, more spelling variations. You've got an Angelica Tiemann, Herman, Peter, Wilhelm. And you know what? Let me, pardon me for just a moment. Okay, never mind. Thought I missed something. So this is the 19 census record, 1910. Okay, so on the 1910 census, you've got Angelic, uh, Angela Thiemann, head of household. She's female, 45 years of age. She's widowed. Number of children born. She had 10 children, only four living. Remember, there's four children coming over. Uh, actually, five children, no, yeah, five children coming over on the passenger list. But on this, uh, in, this pa in this census record, you've got John and Herman. Now, where are the other two children? Well, here's the census record for uh, 1910 for Albert and Sophia Roethlisberger. And down here, here's Albert, here's Sophia, here's their kids. Here is Peter and Wilhelm Thiemann, nephew. So two of the kids are living with their aunt and uncle. I did find a grave mentioned uh, in the Pittsburgh area, uh, a grave for a Herman Thiemann who died in 1898, July 25th, but no date of birth given. Also for a Frederick Thiemann who died September 17th of 1898. Again, no birth given. Both of these are buried in St. Mary's Cemetery uh, in pauper's graves. But where is this child Gertrude that is listed? And then who is this Herman? There was no other Herman besides the husband that showed up on that passenger list. Well, come to find out, I could not find any death records in uh, Pittsburgh. However, uh, these folks were in, uh, uh, in a region that was not yet incorporated with Pittsburgh yet. And so here's the death record. You've got Herman Joseph, uh, died July 24th of 1898, and then interred July 25th of 1898. Uh, he dies of cholera. This is my third great-grandfather. And come to find out, remember they arrive uh, July 5th, I believe it was July 5th, and then 20 days later, roughly, he passes away. And can, let me, you know, looking at the conditions we're in now, we're all dealing with this COVID. Uh, we're worried about you know, people getting sick. Uh, cholera was uh, you know, rampant in Europe and America. 
and it was in waves and at least four big waves. And turns out my ancestor probably caught this either before he left or on board the ship. And he was on that, he was in that fourth wave that died of cholera uh, that came over in the late 1800s. Now this Frederick, uh, I know that this is my ancestor, one of my ancestors' children because, uh, okay, we've got the date of death, September. So they come in July. So roughly two months later and the oldest son passes away and you've got the parents' name, Herman and Angelica. They're at 904 Gerst Alleyway in the third ward. I did mess this up. This is not July, this is September. Date of internment was in September. So this kind of gives us a little puzzle to, to work through. Uh, I did find a grave uh, uh, for a Herman Thiemann who died July 25th of 1898. Date of birth, according to the marriage record, uh, he, uh, he was born in 1859. Shipman Manifest states he's 38 years old. That, that works out. A register states he was 37 in one month. So it's close enough. The grave of Frederick died September 17th of 1898. Date of birth, 24th November, 1887. On the birth record, now these birth records are in German. You got the ship manifest. He goes by Siegfried, was 10 years old. Registers states he was 10 years old in 10 months. And the parents are listed as Herman and, and Angelica. But still, where is Gertrude in all this? And then who is this child named Herman? Well, going back to the birth records, uh, this is a uh, birth record there in Munchen Gladbach, uh, number 812, uh, on the date of 26 April 1898, to the factory worker of Herman Joseph Thiemann, residing in Gladbach, and Angelica Thiemann, born Tunker, his wife, on the 25th of April 1898, at two o'clock, a child of the male gender was born who was given the first name of Gerhard. So, Whoever was writing out that passenger list when they arrived in New York, they did not hear it correctly. They wrote Gertrude. It was actually Gerhardt. So you've got to look at these passenger lists carefully. They've got some great information, but you know there could be some twists and turns in there as well. So uh, poor guy, he, he started as uh, Gertrude, uh, Gerhardt, and then Gertrude. But what's unusual is I don't see anything for Gerhardt from that point on. These are the birth records that I came up with. Also, when you look at those birth records, and I found this um, when I went to this area, it will tell you the, the housing, uh, the house numbers. Uh, and I actually walked the streets where my ancestors lived in these areas. I went to the church where they attended and where their uh, baptisms were performed. Uh, incredible research, just incredible place to be when you can walk in the steps of your ancestors. Remember, there are four children that are living according to that census record. You've got Peter, Frederick, Johann, and it looks like Gerhard should be alive. Also notice there are two sets of twins born in 1896 and 1897. This is a, uh, a map, and this comes from MapBuyer, which is a great resource if you want to look at some of these early maps in Europe. Uh, this is Munchen Gladbach. This is just west of Dusseldorf across the Rhine River. Uh, many of those uh, documents, remember, it mentions the little suburb of Holt. This is Holt right here. There's other documents uh, where my uh, third great grandfather was living in Poth. But uh, great map. And, you know, I went to Montreal Gladbach, uh, drove out to this area. Uh, 
I was able to connect with a researcher before I left on my trip in Mönchengladbach, in the church uh, where a lot of the records are, are kept. And I visited with her when I was there. And I, I asked her, you know, many of these records call Herman a factory worker. And I asked, uh, her name was uh, Margot Bremer. I asked Margot, you know, well, what factories were in operation at that time? Because when you go there today, there's really nothing as far as a uh, factory. It's, it's uh, agrarian. It's uh, pasture land. It's farmland. And what she told me was there were textile mills set up all over the place in the area. But around the turn of the century, around 18, late 1800s, uh, a lot of that went away and moved over to Dusseldorf. And so the factories closed up in this area, in this region. And then, you know, it all moved to Dusseldorf, just to the west. Um, and they probably left because they were looking for a, some sort of a living. This is an example of a death record. Uh, this is number five, 431. This is one of the children. Again, you've got factory worker Herman Thiemann. And when you look at some of these, if you can learn a little bit of German, if you can figure out the birth dates or the, you know, what words are associated with uh, a birth date or a occupation or uh, marriage records. And, and like uh, was brought up earlier, uh, Catherine Scover has a great resource uh, for these documents and how to read these, uh, these early records. Uh, a lot of them are in either Fruchter or uh, 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 early script. Uh, you've got the mother, Angelica Thiemann, born Tunker. So this is the maiden name. So I was able to decipher or figure out what the maiden name was. Also, by the way, when I was in Germany working with this researcher, uh, I, was, I was amazed at the kindness because this person had put together this book. Uh, she had been to the, looked through the family books in the area uh, and put together a whole history of my family going back another probably 10 generations that I had no knowledge of. Uh, and it all checks out. I've been able to research it since. Uh, but uh, my family was there in this area for a good long while. And then this child, Joseph Thema died in, 7th of May, 1897. So when you put it all together, uh, I was able to figure out the dates of birth, the dates of death. Here are the twins right here and their, their dates of death. Um, now, again, there's nothing for this Gerhard. No information that I could find. Um, so I kept looking. There is that Herman theme and it keeps showing up. The father was born in 1859. He died in 1898, July 25th. Gerhard theme and he was born April 25th, just two months before they leave for America and they're in Gladbach, Germany. This Gertrude on the passenger list was born April 1898. Now, when you look at the other records for this Herman Joseph theme and that keeps showing up, the 1910 uh, Pennsylvania census, date of birth, 1898. Germany, he's from Germany, listed with Angelica. Marriage license from 1910, date of birth, 1898. The parents are listed. 20, uh, the 1920, 1930 Ohio census, the date of 1898 keeps showing up. Then the naturalization record from 1933. Also lists the date of birth of 1898. Also, the veterans' compensation record that I was able to locate. Date of birth, 1898. Now, miss the month, but that could be a Scribner error. Also, the parents are listed, Herman and Joseph, or Herman and Angelica. So what does this all mean? What's going on here? Well, and I've... I've Ask this to other researchers. It appears 
that Herman Joseph, the father, dies within days after arriving in America. Angelica, she's got a two-month-old infant. She renames her infant child to honor her dead husband. So it's interesting, you know, th this has just been fascinating to me, uh, looking at passenger lists, looking at census records, uh, every sort of record I could come up with, and following the trail. Uh, this, by the way, is my second great-grandfather right here. So Gerhardt is now Herman. And when you look at the Cuyahoga County, Ohio census from 1930, uh, you've got Herman Thiemann. And then you've got John H or John, Hen John Henry is what he went by as the brother. So my great, great grandfather was living with his brother in Cuyahoga back in 1930. And when I did all this research, I always worried, you know, you, you get so close to these people, you know, you feel close to them. And I worried, you know, was, was Angelica alone here in America? Uh, well, no, she wasn't. Remember, uh, Sophia came over. They're going to visit uh, originally Albert Roethlisberger and Sophie or Sophia. Uh, this is the marriage record for Albert Roethlisberger, who is a Swiss. He's from Switzerland. He's a coppersmith, and Sophia Dunker, or Tunker, from Germany. And they're living at Spring Garden Avenue Alley in Pennsylvania. Now, this is the same address where Herman Joseph died. And looking at the passenger list for, the, uh, for Sophia uh, when she came over, I believe this Pete Dunker, Pete Tunker, uh, this is an uncle. Then you've got all these other children. Here's Sophia. Uh, they're Boilermakers. So this part of the family was inter doing Boilermaker, uh, working as Boilermakers. They were in the C, uh, number C aft, or letter C aft section. This four, this is luggage. Also here, you've got a Wilhelm Homaker and a Gertrude Homaker. Gertrude was also another sister. And then they're in aft as well. They're coming with their children. They've got three pieces of luggage. What, what fascinates me is, again, here's a family that is uprooting themselves, coming to America, and you've got roughly, what, eight Show eight, uh, in eight individuals here. You got four pieces of luggage. Here's another group of probably about, well, probably another one, two, three, four, seven, and they've got three pieces of luggage. They're fitting in all their life into just a few pieces of luggage. Another thing I noticed when I was doing research is the further I went back, some of these documents started coming up in French. This is an example of a document that I was able to obtain through uh, Margot Bremer. Uh, this is for a Johann Peter Schiffer from 1808. And this is during the final days of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, what was going on? You've got the, the revolution of 18, or 1756 in France versus Britain. Uh, Prussian versus Austria. Uh, the French Revolution is going on in 1789. Uh, the French Republic proclaimed in 1792. Uh, King Louis is executed in 1793. And then you've got Bonaparte and the Treaty of Lunaville. In 1801, the Treaty of Lunaville proclaimed that the West Bank of the Rhine belonged to France. So during that time period, everything west of the Rhine River uh, was under France uh, control. And then in 1814, you've got the Congress of Vienna and also the formation of the German Confederation. 
So this is, I hope this has been interesting to you. I think that's one of my last slides. Uh, and then this is uh, the uh, Church St. Vitus that I visited. This is uh, Margot Brema. Uh, this is Munching Gladbach. Uh, incredible church. This is built in nine, 948. Uh, and it sits on top of this big hill. And I was able to go here and, and see the actual uh, family books uh, written uh, for my family and, and their names listed on the pages. Now, I want to, if you got a moment, I want to go to our uh, website. And when you research the records at the land office, it's go, you go to glo.texas.gov. You want to click on history. And then you've got the land grant search. So if you click on that, and remember, we, one of the forms we looked at it'll work. Huh. It's not, ah, here we go. Ah. It may not let me do it. I don't know why, but What is it you're trying to do? I'm trying to go to our land grant database to show you how to research for these documents in our collection. Okay, so are you trying to open a browser window? Yes. Okay, should um, try, try going back over into your, your presentation screen and hitting your escape key to get out of the presenters mode. Okay. Close PowerPoint altogether. Okay. You know, you should be able to open your browser window and share that with us again. Okay. Well, that may not be it either because earlier I tried to go in uh, before our session started and I could not get to the database. Let me see if I can get to the, the map store, see if that'll work. The only thing I can figure out is they possibly might be working on, no, that's not working either. Our IT department might be working on some of the databases today. Hey, Kathleen, did you try to say something? You're, we're not hearing you. Oh, you're not hearing me? Oh. I hear you, I'm not hearing Kathleen Murray. She's trying to say something. Well, regardless, uh, and let me open back up to that last screen. Actually, I'm gonna have to open that up. When you go to the General Land Office website, you go to www.glo.texas.gov, and then you'll click on history. Kevin, do you want to share that screen? Because we're just seeing your camera at the moment. Okay, let me let me do that then.
Well, Bernard, I, I've, I've lost you. Look for that little uh, blue background, white camera, and click on that. That should bring your Zoom controls back up, and then you'd have the share button on the bottom of your window there. Okay, now I see. All right, let me share this. Looks like it's coming early. There's the PowerPoint. Okay, all right, you see it? You see a PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so this is uh, other resources that you can uh, you can search for those folks that came with the Adelsmanine. Uh, you can go to the Sophienberg Library. They've got a great museum and archive there. Also, the Center for American History here in Austin. Sometimes you may get lucky and find things in Fredericksburg. Um, here's my information. But I wanted to go back over. And when you go to our website, glo.texas.gov, you will click on History, on the History tab. From there, you will click on land grant search. It'll be on the left. There you put in uh, your ancestor's name, put in last name, comma, space, first name, and then hit enter. What you should come up with is you will find those German immigration contracts. You will find the Fisher Miller transfers. You will find the actual land grant files and maybe other documents associated. Uh, it could be uh, things like uh, maybe a court of claims file, uh, maybe uh, some sort of, uh, there are various things that you might find, but primarily you wanna find the German immigration contract or the Fisher Miller transfer and the actual land grant file. And keep in mind that the land grant will be in the name or given out under the auspices of the Fisher Miller Company. Uh, I apologize that we can't go to the website, but are there any questions? Yeah, Kevin, we do have one question that, uh, from Barbara Schneider. Yes. Uh, she's saying after statehood in particular, when people were getting land, what records are in the general land office versus the local courthouse? She has some ancestors that came in 1869. Okay. Purchased land. The land grants were being issued and there were various forms of, of land grants that were issued out under the state and the Republic. Uh, head rights being the, well, titles from Mexico, head rights, bounties and donations under the early Republic. We also had what are called preemption grants, which were basically homestead grants that covers roughly 1860, 1870 time period. Now, we also sold land under what's called school land. Uh, a lot of this is found in West Texas. Um, and it was land sold by the state and the proceeds were used to help fund the education system in Texas. Uh, that goes on through the early 1900s, even sometimes today. There was a court case called Hope versus Baker which came out in around 1895, which essentially stated that we have no more public land to be issued out in the form of a land grant. And so here and there we're selling small parcels, uh, which tend to be school land uh, beyond that. But as far as obtaining a grant, uh, you don't see that past 1895. Now, that's what we have uh, as far as the grants. And you can search, uh, if you go to our website and click on history and then forms, you can find our handouts for the various types of land grants. If you do not find your ancestor in our collection, it doesn't mean he's not here in Texas. It means more than likely that they purchased land from a private owner. If that is the case, it's a county record. It's not a part of the GLO collection. What you'll find in our collection are for those individuals that came to Texas and obtained either a grant or purchase land 
from the state. Uh, I hope that answers, uh, gives you some answers there for your question. Yes, thank you. Sure. Anything else? Kevin, I thought it was interesting the database you're putting together where you showed us the spreadsheet and the towns of origin. Yes. I almost expected more of them to be all coming from the same town, well, sort of similar to what you saw of your ancestors that came in to Pittsburgh. Yes. Now, the database, remember, the database has over a little over 2,600 entries. We only saw small snapshots, small snippets. Um, and you do find, it may not be same families, but it could be groups, friends that are getting together and making this journey to Texas together. Uh, but you do have, and some families are not coming all at once. You may have some family coming over on the Garonne. Uh, six months later, another family is coming on the Johan Dethert. Uh, but they could all be, uh, you know, from the same family, uh, much like mine did. You know, it took several years between 1890 and 1898. But yes, that's the fascinating thing is if you, if you sort this database, once I'm done with it, if you sort it by date, I am almost convinced that you're going to see that the ships and the dates are going to just line up perfectly. Unfortunately, there are little problems. Remember, these documents were taken out of the books. I wish I could have stopped it. I, I just, I do not understand the archivist mind sometimes that they want to take apart a book and put documents into individual file folders. The book served a purpose. Uh, I really truly believe that these books you know, whether they were bound at the time of departure or right after. But these books were put together. As people were coming on board the ship, they are, they're going to list the first, you know, the first name or the first contract is going to have the name of the ship. And then right after that, you'll see the dates lining up. And within one or two days after they are signing this contract, they're getting on board the ship and they're leaving for Texas. So it is, you know, either, either you're going to think I'm the biggest nerd or it's just fascinating to me. But when you look at this, and this has never really been looked at quite this way. I've been here 19 years and I never really followed through and saw it until I put it together in the database. And so it was incredible to me the way it's worked out. Okay, do we have any other questions for Kevin? You can unmute yourself and ask it if you wish. On a kind of a last note, um, right now, unfortunately, the, the world we're living in, you know, our archive is closed. Uh, I come into the office uh, once or twice a week. Uh, I am fielding questions and answers and uh, by phone or email. Um, it doesn't look like we're going to be opening back up until maybe sometime in the first of next year. So for right now, we're still shut down. We've been shut down since mid-March. But for anybody who has a question, uh, feel free to email me or call and I will uh, help you the best I can. Okay, Kevin. Well. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was very interesting, uh, both the, the information available at the land office and also sharing some of your techniques that you were able to trace the family. I think that may give folks some ideas of yeah. alternate spellings and his Gertrude right. Gerhardt, <laughs> who then becomes named after his father after the father dies. Yes. So you really have to understand the history uh, the location and the family to yes. be you most know, my, successful. My biggest tip I can give is look at everything. Passenger list, census records, death records, birth records, uh, baptismal records. Uh, these are all little clues. You know, we're, if you're doing genealogy, you are 
you're playing detective on a puzzle and you're trying to put all those little pieces together and each one and and you know they're going to be twists and turns and, and what's fascinating about that story is the poor guy he started out as Gerhardt, then he was gertrude and now he's herman um incredible but thank you for having me it's uh it's it's a pleasure to uh do this we're all kind of uh living in this uh webinar world right now and uh, you know i miss being in front of a, an audience and talking with people and being able to ask you know having interaction back and forth but uh you know thank goodness we're we're, we're okay and we're, we're still here and we can do this Okay, well, thanks again, Kevin, for the, all the information. And reminder, encourage everybody again, join the Facebook group if you haven't already. And our next meeting will be November 7th at 1.30 with Dwayne Stabler about the North Texas chapter of Germans from Russia. So thanks again, Kevin. Thanks, Tony, for all your help as always. Uh, thanks to Anne, my co-leader, uh, and the stuff she's been able to assist with as well while she's in the process of selling her house anybody want to buy a house see him <laughs> so thank you all and we'll see you uh virtually in november and hopefully before then interacting on the facebook uh, site so thank you all all right thank you bye bye Hi, everybody This has been a production of the Dallas Genealogical Society. If you're already a member, thank you. If you're not a member, please consider joining now by going to dallasgenealogy.com and clicking on the Membership tab. Your membership dues will help us support the genealogy section of the Dallas Public Library and that will allow us to continue our education and preservation efforts.